Well, as we open up the scriptures tonight, let me invite you to first join myself and one another in a moment of prayer as we pray in the manner that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the title of my Good Friday sermon is Peering into the Mystery. Mark 15, verse 33, picking up where we left off with our scripture reading, reads like this. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and he breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. At the heart of the Christian faith is a mystery. It's the mystery of God's victory of salvation accomplished through the crucifixion of his Son. The mystery is expressed here at the very last verse we read in verse 39, a very important part of Mark's gospel. Upon Jesus breathing his very last breath, the centurion says a remarkable confession. Truly, this man is the Son of God. This would have implied a change of allegiance for the centurion. Roman emperors claim the title of Son of God and And they claim that title alone. And the mystery of Good Friday is how Jesus of Nazareth dying on a cross might lead one to recognize him as the Son of God. Sometimes we call this in the Christian tradition the Paschal mystery, the Passover mystery. I want to suggest this evening that mystery is actually a good thing for theology. It's a good thing for faith. Sometimes we we try to avoid mystery or explain it away. We think that if there's too much mystery, we're we're not trying hard enough to, to understand. I think the truth is, though, that mystery doesn't hide the truth from us. It actually opens up the truth for us to enter and explore to learn and experience. The mystery of the cross is how one might see this Jewish man crucified and yet come to a conclusion that some victory has been accomplished, that this is truly the Son of God. I think there are some clues in the text in Mark's gospel that help us to peer into this mystery. And that's, that's all I really want to do tonight. It's just give us a few ways of, of looking and entering into and, and peering into the mystery of the crucifixion. One of the, the more interesting ways to read Mark, I think, and if you were able to listen to our Palm Sunday sermon from this past Sunday, you saw a bit of this, is to read it in its historical context. So to read it with an eye on both the Jewish scriptures and the 
the history of the Israelites, the tradition of the Hebrew Bible, and also the the, the culture around them, the, the, the Roman Empire and their practices. And, and you can do the same with the, the passion narrative and I think come to some interesting results and conclusions. And, and a lot of interesting work from scholars have been done. The passion narrative is, is obviously full of many details that are shameful, that magnify Jesus' suffering that show him humiliated and defeated. Jesus is betrayed. He's abandoned. He's denied by some of his closest followers. If we were to keep reading, we would read about some women who stayed and and went to the tomb. Thank God for women. Even from the beginning, they're leading the Christian faith when the men are failing. But Jesus is abandoned by his, his closest disciples. He's, he's lied about. He's mocked. He's beaten. He's spit on by Jewish authorities. The Roman soldiers, they beat him and they mock him. Finally, he's crucified. And as he's crucified, he's being mocked further. There are hints, though, in this story. And knowing a bit about the history and the historical context will help us tease out those hints that this is not just helpless suffering. That even in the midst of this shameful, humiliating death, a victory is being accomplished. And this truly is the Son of God revealed most clearly to us. A few things I'll point out to you. The first is that in the Gospel of Mark, there's this theme of prophetic fulfillment. So by the time we get to the crucifixion narrative, Jesus has already explicitly three times predicted that he would be crucified. And this illustrates his prophetic power. So in a way, what's happening to Jesus, as shameful as it is, is in another sense, an example of his his power and status as a prophet. The ability to predict one's death and the details surrounding it would have been regarded in a lot of parts of the Roman Empire as a sign of divine power. And even with the smaller details around the crucifixion, Jesus predicts a number of things. Judas' betrayal, Peter's triple denial, the desertion of his disciples. And so in the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecies, you get a hint that something else is going on than just Jesus helplessly suffering. When Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's citing the very first verse of Psalm 22. And it's likely, I think, and I've argued this before in in sermons, that when Jesus recites this first line of Psalm 22, he's intending to invoke the whole poem not just that, that first sentiment there. The intention is to provide a kind of prophetic background for what's happening for the crucifixion. A lot of the details of Psalm 22 are fulfilled in the crucifixion story. The mocking that happens, the dividing of the clothes and the casting of lots, Jesus' mouth drying up. But importantly, if, if you were to go back and read through Psalm 22, it doesn't end in 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 death and suffering, but rather in deliverance and vindication of the suffering one, who is indeed the righteous one. Another hint, I think, that Jesus is already on the cross expressing his belief that what is happening to him is an important part of his agenda and task as God's appointed king. There are signs of greatness and power as well that happen during the crucifixion. Two in particular, these supernatural signs that accompany Jesus' crucifixion, they both, I think, serve to communicate the power and the greatness of Jesus. The first one is darkness that covers the whole land during Jesus' death. 
We're told that it's during the sixth hour, which would be noon, where the sun should theoretically be at its highest in the sky. Darkness covers as far as the eye can see. Now, you may not know this, but in, in the ancient world, it was actually a pretty common trope that cosmic signs would accompany the deaths of great and powerful men and rulers. So there's a philosopher, Carnatus, I'm not confident I'm pronouncing that right, but his death was claimed to be accompanied by a lunar eclipse as a sign of how important and great he was. Julius Caesar, perhaps you've heard of him, his death came with the claim made by multiple people that the sun hit its face as he died. Similar darkness was associated with the deaths of people like Alexander the Great, the founder of Rome himself, Romulus. It seems likely that Mark's readers would have no doubt interpreted this darkening of the sun as a cosmic sign that Jesus was indeed a man of great importance, despite this shameful death that he's experiencing. The the second supernatural sign here is the, the tearing of the temple veil from top to bottom at the death of Jesus. It's interpreted differently by different people. Probably the two most likely interpretations of the temple veil being torn into two is that it's a symbol of the destruction of the temple or the end of the Jewish sacrificial system as Jesus takes his place as the once and for all sacrifice for the sin of all humankind. Either way, the event again attributes great significance to Jesus' death as well as to Jesus himself. There are more hints even in this narrative. It's a unique crucifixion. Crucifixion deaths were usually very slow and painful deaths. They would often take days to be completed. The fact that Jesus dies in six hours, is actually a somewhat remarkable detail. And it perhaps suggests that Jesus had a sense of control over the timing of his death and chose when to breathe his last. It's not here in Mark, but in Luke and John, this is actually said explicitly. No one takes my life from me, Jesus says in the Gospel of John. I lay my life down. And for a person to die after six hours is a a unique thing. Another unique detail from this crucifixion story is the loud cry that Jesus makes from the cross. Crucifixion is essentially death by suffocation for the most part. Victims would lose strength as they hung on the cross, unable to keep their body weight from restricting their lungs. And so the ability to cry out loudly, as Mark tells us Jesus did, would have been surprising to people familiar with crucifixions, to the ancient readers, and would have shown some significant strength on the part of the one who is dying. In light of these two details, we we conclude that while Jesus does experience the shameful death of crucifixion, he experiences it unlike many others before and around him. His death is, is anything but an ordinary crucifixion. There's there's one more interesting facet to the the crucifixion episode in the Gospel of Mark that I'll point out for you. And I'm borrowing mainly here from a a man named T.E. Schmidt, and he did some work on the parallels in in Jesus' passion narrative and Roman imperial triumphs, which which are basically these um, army, these these processions of uh, victory. Um, for for Roman emperors and rulers. And and he lists out eight to nine different things that you find in the narrative that correspond fairly closely with what would have happened for for Roman emperors during what would be called a triumph, this kind of procession of of victory. I'll mention just a a couple for you. In, In Mark 15, 17, Jesus is adorned with a purple garment. This is incredibly rare in the ancient Mediterranean world, an extremely expensive type of garment. And before a triumphal procession, say the emperor, they would have been adorned in just such a purple garment. Likewise, they then would have 
had a crown of laurel placed on top of their head, and Jesus has a crown of thorns placed on his head. Jesus receives mock praise from the Roman soldiers as they salute and verbally praise in a mocking way as they prostrate themselves before him. This parallels the kind of homage that Roman soldiers would pay to the triumphator at the outset of this, this Roman triumph. Simon of Cyrene carries Jesus' cross here in Mark, in verse 21. In a Roman triumph, a bull would be sacrificed, and, and that bull would be led as part of the procession. And next to the bull would walk a Roman official carrying a double-bladed axe, an instrument of that bull's death over his shoulder. Jesus here replaces the sacrificial bull as Simon carries the instrument of death over his shoulder. Likewise, the place where the procession ends seems to be a parallel process here. The the Aramaic for Golgotha means the place of the skull. Most Roman triumphs ended at the Temple of Jupiter, sometimes called the Capitolium. This is a Latin word derived from the word caput or, or head, which means both processions of Jesus and Roman triumphs would have ended at the place of the skull. Jesus is offered wine mixed with myrrh, and he refuses to drink this wine in in Mark 15, verse 23. We know at the end of these Roman triumph processions, the emperor would be offered wine, and he would refuse. And immediately after his refusal, the bull would then be sacrificed. And Mark, we're told that as soon as Jesus refuses the wine, the next thing we read is, And then they crucified him. Jesus is crucified between two thieves. At the end of a Roman triumph, the emperor was often elevated above the ground. And there are many examples of of famous Roman emperors being flanked by two people, their second and third in command, one on their right and one on their left. There seems to be this parallel happening in the the story of the crucifixion in Mark's gospel with a normal Roman triumph procession to announce the king's status, identity, for him to receive worship and praise, for him to be acknowledged as the victorious one, and with what happens on the cross. Perhaps this is one of the catalysts for The centurion saying, truly, this is the Son of God. Perhaps this Roman political ideology is being used to boldly claim that Jesus' identity is truly God's powerful appointed ruler that finds its truest expression in service and self-sacrifice, particularly in the act of giving up one's life for the sake of others. The death of Jesus, which is is most likely to be perceived as a weakness on Jesus' resume, is transformed here into a strength. And at the same time, the Roman imperial power is both mocked and undermined. As in their attempt to crucify Jesus, Roman soldiers have unwittingly given them a triumph. I'm convinced that when Mark was written... It was written to Gentile Christians in the Roman region, perhaps in the city of Rome, likely after the temple had been destroyed. And the emperor at that time was a man named Vespasian. And he actually was on a propaganda campaign at the time. And he considered himself the true king of the entire world. And he claimed for himself and himself alone the title of son of God. He had coins minted up, and and one of the things that he actually used as the main line in his propaganda was that he was the one who destroyed Jerusalem and took down the temple. And he had coins printed to commemorate that. And it's likely that Mark's readers, reading the Gospel of Mark, are reading kind of an anti-Roman propaganda script here. Many of the things that this Roman emperor is taking claim for 
is actually being credited to Jesus and to his father in the Gospel of Mark. So at the very beginning of Mark's Gospel, we're told that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, not the Roman Emperor. The Roman Emperor at the time, going on this propaganda campaign, actually did have some miraculous events that were, were told about him. People believed that, that he had done some healings and some, some calming of storms and things like that. And so in a sense, Jesus' Galilean ministry is like a counter-resume. And Jesus is presented as the superior healer, benefactor, the true commander of legions, the master of the wind and waves. Even his greatest military achievement, the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, is presented in the Gospels as orchestrated by the God of Israel, as prophesied by the true Messiah and the Son of God. And so it is that I think the first and perhaps primary truth of the mystery of the crucifixion is that it is indeed in some way God's act of victory. As surprising and spectacular as that might seem to us as it would have seemed to people in the first century. And there are all kinds of ways of describing the meaning of the crucifixion, of how Jesus dying on a cross accomplishes salvation. In fact, the scriptures are full of all kinds of different metaphors for describing it. Some legal metaphors like justification some political metaphors, some economic metaphors like redemption, some relational metaphors like reconciliation. And often what happens when people try to peer into the mystery of the cross is they, they pick one metaphor and they try to make, it, make everything else fit kind of around that. I think instead, as, as an author named Scott McKnight suggests, we should be comfortable with all the different metaphors Scripture gives us. Perhaps they all have their place. Perhaps they all give us some, some insight into the truth of what has happened in the cross. At the cross, Jesus does justify us. At the cross, Jesus does accomplish reconciliation. At the cross, Jesus does redeem us. But oftentimes, Again, Christians get into this narrow mindset and focus on one and perhaps start to even make it a, a caricature of itself. And, and so for me growing up and for many of you, perhaps the main is Jesus paying the price for our sins, almost totally. We had a, we had a penalty coming our way. Because we were sinners, we deserved hell and, and nothing but hell. And Jesus jumps into punishment and takes the wrath of the Father instead of us in our place. I would ask you to read through the four Gospels and look for any mention of that type of idea. You'll be hard-pressed to find it throughout the, the four Gospels. If we only had the Gospels, we probably never would have come up with a theory like this. Now there is Paul usually where we get an idea like that. But it, again, it's not the only language that's used. And I'd like to suggest this evening three ways to continue to peer this Paschal mystery. supposed to work, which is to say it's something that's supposed to take someone who doesn't understand that Jesus is supposed to result in truly this is the Son of God. It's supposed to take someone who is far away from God and bring them close to God. It's supposed to take someone who's far away from themselves and from others and from the world and reconcile them with themselves and with others in the world. The atonement is supposed to work. And real human beings are in real different situations. And sometimes we need different metaphors, different angles 
different approaches. On the cross, Jesus dies with us. He enters into our evil. He enters into our sin. He enters into our suffering to subvert it and to create a new way. There is some complete solidarity that happens on the cross. That's the culmination of the incarnation. Jesus takes on human nature. You see, Jesus doesn't come just to save the lost, the tired, those enslaved to death and sin. No, he comes into those realities with us. And so the, the lost person is no longer alone because Jesus on the cross, God himself, has experienced this. Those who are tired no longer have to wonder if God understands what it's like to be tired. It's one thing to know something from before. It's another thing to know it from experience. God was not content just to know from afar and said, enters into our situation. And in, in doing so, he creates a new path forward through our union. So Jesus dies with us. And for many of us, I think that's a fruitful way of us allowing the atonement to work in our hearts and in our minds, to produce worship and transformation, to allow us to see a little bit more of the beauty of the mystery of the cross. The second one is this, Jesus dies instead of us. So Jesus dies with us, and then now Jesus dies instead of us. He enters into our sin, into our wrath, into our death. The death of Jesus dies is both the rightful result of our sin and the rightful result of that sin, death. But Jesus takes it on instead of us. He absorbs all the power of evil. Paul in 2 Corinthians that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. As a metaphor, side of the scriptures, there was a horror movie that was made a couple decades ago, and, and I promise you I wish I had a better example. But the movie basically goes something like this. There's this place in Alaska, I believe, and and, and once a, a year, there's 30 days of darkness, 30 days of night. And so the vampires in the world, again, I'm so sorry that this is the, the example. The but the, it, it'll pay off. Just walk with me. You stay in this town, and there's kind of this love story that goes on throughout the the movie and, and they're fighting and, and running and trying to escape and, and these aren't your like slow, stupid vampires. These are like the sexy, fast, strong vampires. So it's a losing battle. And they get very close to the sun finally showing up, safety arriving, but not close enough. And the group that's left knows that they'll be killed before before it gets there. And so the lead character in this, this story, out of love for this girl and the friends that they're with, what he does is he actually takes a, a vampire who's been killed and he gets a syringe and he pulls out some blood. And he injects it into his own arm. 
so that he'll turn into a vampire. In doing so, he ensures his destruction, but he also buys some time because now he's going to be able to put up a fight against the vampires until the sun arrives. And I can remember watching this movie as a young teenager. Familiar with this scripture, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And my jaw just hitting the floor and going, what is that if not the mystery of the cross? Can I explain it perfectly? No. Perhaps metaphors and stories are our best way at getting at this mystery. But in some deep and powerful way, what should have and was supposed to happen to us instead has been taken on by God himself out of love for his creatures. Jesus dies with us. Jesus dies instead of us, the last one this evening. On the cross, Jesus dies for us. His death forgives our sins, declares us right. This is justification. Absorbs the wrath of God and sin. It creates new life where there was once only death. St. Ignatius of Antioch, in his, one of his letters, he's an early church father, says this, I, I just love this quote, Jesus Christ died for us in order that by believing in his death, you might escape death. Jesus dies for us. And in his death, he, he performs an act of revelation. In his death, he reveals most fully what God is like. First John will say, see what love the Father has for us, that Jesus would offer up his own life. The cross is the clearest picture we'll ever get of the eternal nature, the true heart of the Creator God. And human beings throughout all of history have been so tempted to imagine God as a projection of themselves or of their own fears, their, their worst nightmares. And we create Zeus's and Poseidon's. Perhaps we would never imagine a God of infinite love. A God who would pour out his own life on behalf of those who had walked away, who had betrayed who had sinned against him. Likewise, on the cross, Jesus reveals for us what humanity is truly supposed to be like. Living in submission to the Father's will, willing to live a life of sacrifice, trusting the Father to vindicate us, even in the midst of great suffering, even in the midst of death itself. I'm a big fan, as I've grown in my theological understanding of, of the Eastern Orthodox tradition of theology. And in Eastern Orthodoxy, mysteries are very clearly to be celebrated and not solved. They kind of revel in mysteries. And one of the things that Eastern Orthodox Christians do, Roman Catholics do this as well, perhaps in some, some different ways, is they try to participate in the mystery of the cross by making the sign of the cross. Perhaps you've seen this before. Someone make the sign of the cross. They do this whenever the name of the triune God is uttered in, in church services as a way of confessing their faith in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as a way of acknowledging that the only way they can come before God is through what Christ has accomplished on the cross. And as, as weird as it may seem to us, if you come from a background like mine, which is Baptist, non-denominational, basically Protestant, to, to do physical acts as a way of expressing our faith or entering into mystery, 
I wonder if the sign of the cross is something that perhaps we could explore as a way of entering into or participating with the mystery of the cross. So the way the Eastern Orthodox Christians do it, during a service, the priest will make the sign of the cross. His right hand will go up, down, and then left and right, making the sign of the cross over the worshipers. And then the people make the sign of the cross over themselves by touching first their forehead, then their sternum, then their right shoulder, and then their left shoulder. Notice that instead of copying the priest, they make the sign in response to the priest, as if they were facing the priest. And, and Orthodox Christians do this at all times. So even at home, when they make the sign of the cross, they do it as if they are in the presence of a service of worship. They confess with their hands that they receive God's blessings only and always as members of his worshiping community. The second thing they do is something very specific with their fingers and hands that further makes confession of the mystery of their faith. So they take their thumb and their index finger and their middle finger and they make them touch each other and then they tuck the tips of their ring finger and pinky finger into their palms. Touch their forehead, their sternum, their right shoulder, and their left shoulder. And it's a physical way to confess their belief in the triune God, with the three fingers touching the Father, Son, and Spirit, and then also in the two natures of the person of Christ, the God-man, both divine and human. And they're often encouraged to make the sign of the cross during times of temptation. They're often encouraged to make the sign of the cross at times where they are requesting or in need of blessing from God. It's easy to see, but hard to overstate how important the sign of the cross is for the the lived reality of Orthodox Christians in their faith. Because the cross points them to a Savior that's achieved victory over sin and death and Satan on their behalf. And to make the sign of the cross is to embrace that victory is to enter into the mystery. And so this Good Friday, may the mystery of the cross be something not for us, something for us to celebrate. May we look for the language and the metaphors that most poignantly touch our hearts, inform our current situations. May we see in the crucifixion of Jesus the victory of God's salvation. And like the centurion, say truly, this is the Son of God. Will you pray with me? Father, we give you thanks that in the passion of your Son, You have achieved for us and the world true victory, true salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, the freedom from the slavery of sin and death, which we were so in need of. As we worship this weekend, As Holy Week comes to its climax, may the mystery of the cross invite us in that we may experience and participate in and be transformed by the death of Christ with us instead of us and for us. We pray all these things in the name of of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.